you have prepared this space for us so that we might experience and encounter and be strengthened by your gift of love. As we worship together this morning, allow for the symbols and the practices, the music and the prayers to help us to connect with you. Now bless our time today. In the name of Christ we pray. I want to say good morning to you, but before you start doing what we usually do, <laughs> let me talk about, some of you already saw the note that was sent out, about how do we as a church respond? We are not an alarmist people, but we are also not naive. And I appreciate the doctor who said not alarmist, not naive, but we are smart. Probably good advice for every single day of life. But we also want to be mindful of sisters and brothers who have compromised immune systems. How are we welcoming to them? And so for, we don't know how many weeks or whatever, we're going to try in this greeting time, smiles, waves, bows, somebody was giving curtsies at the 9 o'clock service, but be very mindful of our sisters and brothers. At communion, you may have already noticed, things look a little different. Uh, when it comes time for communion, uh, you will come forward and bread will be placed in your hand. And you will go to one of the trays where you will find one of the cups. You will take that and drop the cup in one of the trash cans. It might be over the top, but I tell you, it's one of the things where it's been interesting. Uh, Protestant denomination. Catholic Church, uh, Orthodox churches, have all been in kind of conversation this past week of trying to put forth best practices. And for somebody like me that did not have a class in seminary about how to deal with this, that has been very helpful. It always feels strange, though, to do something like this in the middle of worship. As Frank Craddock used to say, you just heard this wonderful sermon, inspired, your heart was lifted up, and then somebody got up and said, there's a blue shepherd laying out the parking lot with lights on, and everything happened to go on. But I share this because I think it's important. And hopefully, some point down the road, we will be getting back to some of our old practices. But for right now, I invite you to greet with a smile, a wave, a nod, a bow, whatever is best for you. <laughs>
we have something that's designed to lift us up, then we feel some need to put rules around it. I don't know about you, growing up as a kid, free, really excited about the world, and all of a sudden I started learning about the rules that you had to follow. And even religion, if we look through the history of Christianity, what started as a really freeing movement, a movement that involved a change of heart, religious authorities typically tried to add a bunch of rules that you had to follow to where we find ourselves often following the rules but missing that whole change of heart. So this morning in this worship service, we want to call you back to what being a follower of Jesus was really all about. How do we change from the heart, change the approach we have in life, see everyone around us as a beloved child of God, and learn to lead with love? This next song is called Forever Change.
on Sunday morning so that the other six days and 20 some hours, we might be able to better live it because it is a challenge. And yet we believe it's what God is and will continue to call us to do in this world. I do remind you about those blue cards in your worship guides. Take a moment to fill them out. Let us know how we can pray for you. And later in the service, there'll be an opportunity to place those in the baskets. Unless you think about joining, and then keep a hold of it, and you give it to me or to one of our elders at the close of the service. Want to lift up that tomorrow is Gringo Spirit Day. Uh, the Gringos right next door to us here is uh, uh, going to give us a little gift for all the money we spend there. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. Throughout the day, we have people gathering over there, and I find it interesting. I'll go, and there'll be a table of 15 people, and then seven of them will leave, and seven new people will come and sit, and there's a lot going on. And uh, as long as you say, hey, this is a part of Cypress Street Christian Church Spirit Day, 20% of your bill comes back to the church. And this month, it's going to our children's program, and specifically an event that's coming up in April that I'm going to talk about here in just a moment. I do want to lift up that our 50-plus group uh, is, good. is going to be having its lunch coming up on March the 19th. That's a Thursday. Uh, it's a week from this coming Thursday. And we just need to know how many folks are coming to get signed up and make sure we have the right amount of food. So please, please let us know. I do want to lift up that um, our children's minister, uh, Reverend Tamika Nelson, was at a meeting and found out that most of the schools in the Klein School District, one Friday a month, would provide lunches for the entire staff. Parents would do that. Well, a number of the schools have not been doing it because they haven't been able to get parents to do it. And so Tamika just happened to mention maybe she had churches to do it. And she came back to me and said, do you think we could take one of them? And so just so you, ne you know, I already obligated you all. Uh, we are going to be doing uh, Klein High School right up the road on Friday, March 27th. Cypress Creek is going to be providing the meal. And so for the next two Sundays, we're going to be inviting people to consider, if you will, adopting one or two of the staff people for their lunch. And then we'll be meeting a handful of folks who will actually go there and serve the lunch that day. So we're thinking about that. The money, again, from the uh, from Gringo Spirit Day is going to be going to the bunny uh, hop, uh, trunk hop that is coming up uh, very soon, uh, April the 10th. But there is a lot of work that we need to do because every year it gets bigger. We think we guess how much bigger it's going to get, and it's always been bigger than what we guessed it would be. So that's a lot of eggs that we need to stuff. And so we have a stuffing party coming up that you will find in your worship guides, a list of everything that we need help with. So I hope you will be prayerful for that. There's a sign-up sheet out here if you are willing to be a part of the, uh, uh, the stuffing party. I think there's even going to be some prizes there. So it can be a family occasion. So we need all the help we can get with that. And then finally, I just want to lift up our high school youth that are out of the camp at Gonzales. Actually, they'll probably be hitting the road back this direction very soon. But keep them in your prayers. And Mariah as well, as she's been part of the leadership team out there this weekend. Well, today is the second Sunday of Lent. And there is our theme focused on this word, why. A word, a question that has with it a purpose. And each week, we are going to be, if you will, stripping away another layer. Pruning what is unhealthy in our lives. Maybe a piece from the past, or maybe a piece that is very much a part of the present. And yet, it probably is not something we should take with us into the future. Now, some of that can be rather painful, if we're honest with ourselves. But it is a part of the process that we need to go through if we are going to be able to follow the life of Jesus in a more faithful way. And as we do a better job of pruning, of removing some of this stuff and leaving it behind, 
I think it allows us to live into a whole different why. The why we are doing the things that we believe God has called us to do. And so each week we're going to watch a short video of one of our folks talking about, in this case, her why. I invite you to watch this video. Scripture is your living word. 
Allow our ears, our hearts, our lives of faith to be made available to that gift. In the name of Christ. Amen. Have you ever been peppered with why questions that you knew were simply intended to be irritating? Have you ever been bombarded with why questions that you knew were, just because they were infused with kind of a whiny tone, you knew they were intended to be annoying? I have, and I'm guessing many of you have as well. Yet in our current culture, there is an eagerness among folks to ask why, but not to be annoyed, not to be irritating, people who genuinely are yearning to understand. In the work environment these days, employees are asking why more and more often, not to complain in the sense of why do I have to do this? No, what they're wanting to understand is why. They want to have a clearer picture of how their piece fits into the larger movement of the organization. It is suggested that knowing, knowing how you fit, creates a greater sense of, of purpose and commitment toward the goals of the organization or the business or the corporation. That same why appears in the world of faith. And sometimes I think those of us that are part of the church, we hear people asking, well, why? We think, oh, they're just trying to be annoying. They're trying to undercut us. But I think there's more people standing outside of church and not having that experience in the part of their lives, and they're wanting to know genuinely why. Why do you do what you do? Why do you believe or act the way that you do? There is a genuine curiosity. A few years back, I attended an event at one of the local mops. Actually, a few of you went with me to that event. And there was a panel discussion with the imam from the mosque. There was a Jewish rabbi and an Episcopal priest. I know it sounds like the start of a really bad joke, but it's, it's, it's what the panel was really made up of. And they were all talking about, from their experience, the idea of fasting. But what's interesting to me is that all three of them started out the same way, explaining when, within their tradition, they would fast and how, in very practical ways, you know, what are some of the things that we do. But when it was opened up to the group that had gathered there, they were mostly why questions. Why do you fast? No, no, I'm not interested in your tradition. I want to know why it's important to you. And that's when the conversation got real fascinating. When people begin to tell their personal stories about why Fasting was so important. In our scripture, the Pharisees, the legal experts, the religious elite of the day, asked Jesus, why are your disciples not living according to the rules that have been passed down to us? There were certain practices about how you washed your hands, before you sat down at a meal. And I guess the disciples of Jesus are not doing it. They are sitting down with ritually unclean hands. Now I'm pretty certain that people have read the words of the religious elite as either kind of being said in a whiny way or in an arrogant way. But I believe the gospel writer is using a really interesting technique, employing the word why to get the reader to ask why. Why would these followers of Jesus 
especially those that had grown up in the tradition and they themselves had washed their hands for years before participating in, in such experience. Why do they in this moment choose not to do it? What's happening here? I'm pretty certain that most of you have heard the story about the family that at Christmas time would always cook a ham and how before putting it in the oven they would cut the ends of the ham off. And the youngest members of the family asked why and their mother said, that's a great question. It's just the way I was taught. It might have to do with maybe, I don't know, keeping the ham moist. I don't know, but you should ask your grandmother. And so they went out to the living room and they asked their grandmother. She said, well, it was the tradition that was passed on to me by my mother. But, you know, tomorrow on Christmas Day, we're going to go to the nursing home to see her. And maybe you should ask her. And so they waited until the next day and they approached her and asked, do you cut off the ends to keep the ham moist? And she said, no, I cut off the ends because my pan was too small for the ham. The story points to how certain practices can be born out of necessity, but can become the rule even when the necessity is gone. Suddenly you have a practice without a purpose. In light of that story, a friend of mine tells another story about how he watched his grandmother bake pies and how she would take the pie directly out of the oven and take it over and open up the refrigerator and place it on a trivet inside the refrigerator. He never thought about asking why she did that, but as he got older, he made his first pie and did exactly as his grandmother had done. Took it out of the oven, put a trivet on the, there in the refrigerator and placed the pie on it. And then, out of curiosity, he called up his grandmother and said, I want to know, do you, do you place it in the refrigerator to help it set up? Do you do that to lock in the flavor? And she said, no. I had so little counter space that I often would turn and I would burn myself on the pan. It was just to get it out of the way. The grandson thought that it was some important pie baking your know, secret. But in fact, it was something very practical. But over time, as he continued to make pies, he started putting them in the refrigerator. Not because there was a real purpose to pie making, but because it reminded him of his grandmother. The practice was rooted in something historical, but then was reinterpreted, and it carried with it a new sense of meaning. Was Jesus opposed to ritual and practice? Was, you know, ready to throw out all the religious ceremony and customs? Of course not. The Last Supper was, in fact, the Passover meal. And Jesus didn't call it the Last Supper. He didn't call it communion. He didn't say, by the way, I'm going to change the name of this tonight. No, it was still the Passover meal. It was only later that we added different language to it. It was an important meal that described a God who heard the cries of the people and responded in love and with liberation. The very things that were a part of the life of Jesus. And yet it's interesting to me how certain practices around the table can become so rigid in, for instance, who is welcome or how it's done other things. I remember the first worship committee meeting I ever attended at the church I served in Kansas City. The week before, a chalice that always sat in the center of the communion table that the minister would lift up high during the words of institution, this big, beautiful chalice, as if it was being taken back to the kitchen that Sunday, it was dropped. Shattered. And it was interesting, at our committee meeting, one of the people said, I don't know what we will do. I can't imagine communion without that chalice. It won't have the same meaning. Now, I understand tradition. 
I understand the power of symbol, a symbol like that, but had power been given to that specific symbol that was a little beyond what should have been given to it. And at least some people lost perspective of what was happening in that experience. It doesn't matter how holy you might make a religious practice sound, if the why, the why you do it, is nothing more than it's important for us to maintain this ritual, this practice, is that if that's the only why, then it might be time to just dump it. Or maybe to begin trimming away some of the nonsense so that we might refine, refine the real reason. I don't think Jesus was ready to, tap, to toss out the hand washing, but he was challenging those who were consumed with a practice that had forgotten its purpose, focused on a ritual that had lost sight of the reason. In fact, Jesus reclaimed the idea, sort of, when he washed the disciples' feet. He didn't do his own, he did theirs. He knelt before them and, and embodied this act of humility that really was an expression of who he was throughout his ministry and life. A woman by the name of Stacy had been a part of a tradition, a Christian tradition, where they would do the washing of feet every time they had communion. Now, they did communion just four times a year. But during the communion service, people would wash one another's feet. Well, she had been a part of that church all 27 years of her life. And she had to confess that the whole washing of feet was kind of losing its meaning. In fact, it was kind of a hassle, she said, to remember to wear shoes that were easy to take off that Sunday and all of this kind of stuff. And then she went on a mission trip with her church to Honduras, where they worked at a rural medical clinic. When they arrived there, they learned quickly that they were greatly understaffed. And Stacy and one of her fellow folks was assigned to this, this one room with three patients. They didn't use the word hospice, but it basically was for those who were at the end of life. And it was their job to empty bedpans, change sheets, and clean up people. Something that was so far out of her experience. She had never done anything like that, had not been trained to do that. And yet she looked at how people in that room were so vulnerable. And so she took what she did there very seriously and did it to the best of her ability, caring for these people in a very you know, kind and compassionate way. When she returned to the States, the first Sunday where they had communion and the washing of feet, and she heard the minister talk about Jesus humbling himself and taking on that life of a servant, it suddenly had new meaning in light of her experience of serving others. It now carried with it great power that it not for years. Where are you holding on to a practice, a ritual, a tradition, that you're holding on to it and protecting it, and yet you don't even really know why? In fact, maintaining it, protecting it, has become the mission. Is it time to do some pruning, some trimming, to try to get at the real why? I preached a sermon a number of years ago on how rules find their way into our faith. And in the middle of the sermon, I said, you know how rules can become something, you know, that are only done, you know, where, uh, where they, uh, well, uh, you know, they become very ruliness. <laughs> it's one of those moments where I was searching for a word and I made one up. 
Now, there are people in the congregation that I'm pretty certain were thinking to themselves, wow, that's a pretty serious theological word. I'll have to look that up later. But no, I just made it up. I don't think it really is a word. But Bob, one of my elders, who so creative, got up at the table to pray. And he said something along the lines of, when we get stuck on rules for their own ruliness, allow us to get back to doing the work of love in its loveliness. One of those perfect moments. <clears throat> Rituals, practices, traditions, they can be powerful in shaping and forming our lives, preparing us to live the life of faith. But when we can't get at the why, and I'm not suggesting you have to be able to articulate it, sometimes we know the why here, but we can't quite find the words, and that's okay. But let us not get to the point where it's all about protect, protecting some sort of ritual that has lost all of its meaning. Let us pause, do the trimming and pruning, and maybe in the process, refine the meaning, or maybe a new meaning will be birthed out of that experience. At the end of the day, if it helps shape and form, form us to live a life of love, to practice love, to be able to do the hard work of putting love first, then I think Jesus will be okay with whatever the practice, or the ritual, or the tradition might be. You join me in prayer. Reconnect us, Lord God, to the beautiful traditions and practices of the faith, traditions and rituals that, that teach and inform and, and shape us to be the disciples you need us to be, to be the people who embody the love first life. If there is some work that needs to be done within us, if there is some pruning of some practices that are stuck in the past and have lost their purpose, help us to do that difficult work. For in the act of pruning, we are often making room for something to be reborn, something new to grow. Whether it is sharing in corporate worship, singing a song together, breaking bread, or entering the waters of baptism, we pray, O oh God, that these don't just become old and sterile and empty practices, but that they come alive with your spirit that is working to shape us and form us in the ways of Jesus. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.
understand this theory that uh, I think is kind of fascinating. Going back even a thousand years before Jesus, every 500 years, religion has a garage sale. Basically, it moves out a lot of stuff so something new can emerge. And she would suggest that we are at another one of those 500 years. It's just about 500 years ago that we had the Protestant Reformation. And the question is, is what needs to be moved out of the way so that something new can emerge? But it's interesting, not only in those 500 year cycles, but even more often, uh, a new tradition, a new group has emerged. And what often happens is we toss everything out. And then a decade or two later, we go, okay, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> yeah, then we can probably use that. And, and it's fascinating, you know, within our own tradition, when we were birthed, we didn't want to look anything Catholic. And so we wanted nothing to look like the Catholic Church. And, and then it wasn't but a few decades into our tradition that we started saying, you know, things like, well, Lent, the season of Lent, and, you know, Ash Wednesday, and, and you know, celebrating Pentecost, well, maybe they're not so bad after all. They, Maybe they're okay. And so I always want to caution us from being reactionary. Not to just toss everything out, but to do so in a way that is mindful. Maybe it doesn't need to be tossed out. Maybe just something needs to be set aside for a little while and, and allow it, or maybe I should say for God to do something with it, and allow something new to emerge that is needed for this moment. How we share in communion has changed dramatically. And we're changing it again this morning. Now, for practical reasons. But it is a good reminder that the way that we've always done it isn't really the way we've always done it. And it's not the right way or the proper way. It's just a way. So today, it would be good for us to do it in a new way. And allow for God maybe to speak to us in a new and fresh way. For those of you in the main section, you will come forward. And those that are holding the bread will, with the use of tongs, place a piece of bread in your hands. And you will take and you will eat the bread. And then you will go to one of the trays. They will remain on the table. And you will take one of the cups of juice. You will drink it. And then you will put it in one of the trash cans after you have Share the juice. If you need gluten-free, you will find a few of those gluten-free pieces here in this tray. If you're seated on the back row, the elements will be brought to you, and then there is a station in the balcony as well. Something new, but maybe it's good for us. <laughs> Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for the time to take. <laughs> Dearest God, 
You are the source of power in our world. This morning, we are grateful for the opportunity to come before you and partake in the bread and the cup. Too often, even the communion table, this table, your table, has become the target of unnecessary rules and restrictions as man becomes enamored with rituals and or power. But let us never lose sight of the fact that we come to the table to reflect on the love of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made. Let us remember this morning that is our life. We are thankful that every single one of us is welcome at your table, and no rule of man can change that. Dear Lord, please unite our voices as we conclude with the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his betrayal, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body shared for you. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. All is ready. The table has been prepared. All are welcome to come.
love the practices of the faith. As a pastor, to be able to be in the waters of baptism with someone who is being baptized, it's powerful. Um, at the same time, as others have reflected this morning, we can do some strange stuff. All of a sudden, we can have it flipped upside down so that it's doing the exact opposite that it was intended to do. And so it's good occasionally to allow the spirit to trim away some of that stuff and to leave it behind so that something new can emerge. And I pray this day that wherever you are in your life, that you will find one of those loose spots and allow for the spirit to begin some pruning so that whatever needs to be born anew can do so. As you do every Sunday, I extend an invitation. It is an invitation on behalf of the living Christ. For Jesus Christ, the living Christ, desires to be in relationship with us. And today, if you would like to make that connection, uh, not only with Christ, but with this community of faith, you'll be invited to come forward as we are singing or to meet with one of our elders and pastors. Let us now join our voices in our song of discipleship.
Inspire Women's Conference uh, is uh, kind of a national program where folks are coming to Houston. It's a big event, and Stephanie happens to be the lead musician for that event. And I know they're expecting thousands to participate, so kind of exciting. But the neat part is, if you're interested, she can get you cheaper tickets. So talk to her. I invite you to maybe hold out your hands, to hold your hands up, to hold your hands tight. It's ever comfortable for you as we join together in our closing prayer. Gracious God, may your love and